Hello and welcome to today. Rich and I are going to be doing a special episode discussing rituals and entheogen use. So to begin this discussion, we wanted to start with sort of like discussing natural magic and how you begin to approach that. So Rich, do you want to describe what natural magic sort of is? Well, this is one of the main categories that are often used to describe different uh, schools of ma or techniques within magic, though any particular magician might mix this with ceremonial magic or it's it's usually the more pagan or witchcraft oriented stuff, but it's also very applicable to hermetic ideas or like the doctrine of signatures. So so this would yeah, include I things like like nature worship and root work, right? As well as things like sympathetic magic then? Using using natural uh, plants or gemstones or anything from nature in your ritual work, basically, which has symbolic meaning within the ritual to express your intention in any number of ways. Uh, whereas ceremonial magic is more like using prayers and images and text-based magic and typically it's abrahamic but not necessarily these can be kind of loose terms so but if you have ever read a grimoire i mean it's they do sometimes call for psychoactive incense like as in liber geratus or cornelius agrippa talks about this but it's not the, but they're usually doing nightshades and entheogens that are very dangerous and we don't recommend them really. No, no, they're not the most easy to work with. It's far easier to, to try, you know, work, work with the more easier things. Like I always recommend people begin with cannabis, right? It's a really good one for connecting with uh, that energy of Saturn or Aphrodite and it's not too psychedelic. It's something that e everyone can start with and can easily build off of. Yeah, it's definitely the, the a good place to start before you dive in with, with the heavy trips. So uh, also with ceremonial magic, while it's not impossible to do this in an altered state, if you have to memorize these long prayers and you're summoning up demons and stuff, it's it's really not beginner work and... And to be honest, I don't recommend you use Abrahamic magic in general. Even if you want to learn from it, don't re stay away from the Abrahamic religions in general, probably. Uh, right. The, the reason why we cautious pe caution people on this front is just because like, a lot of that is very dark magic. It's invoking a lot of negative spirits, and it is invoking these spirits in a very aggressive way, right? Yeah, and... You know, some of it, like the greater keys, does call for the sacrifice of a goat or something. So with all of this, you have to, uh, especially from a chaos magic perspective, you have to take what's useful and, and appropriate for you and, uh, and leave it behind. So we recommend that you start simply, and uh, natural magic is especially good for using while you're in an theogenic state. But that doesn't mean you, you can't use prayers or sigils. But really, a prayer from your heart that's improvised and honest is going to be better than trying to uh, use some Christian prayer that doesn't mean anything to you. So Right. I, I feel like this is a really important point, just because a lot of people... Who get involved into the magic tradition they, they they purchase grimoires that have a very prescribed poetic form that you're supposed to say and they do not connect with it and they try to invoke these spirits with it and it doesn't work you know and then they be, they, they become frustrated and so in like in my personal experience i've always found that like you were just suggesting that spontaneous connection is the most important thing it's that trying to be in that artistic space and in that space of belief and of love right you're trying to open yourself up to something else and you're trying to connect with it you know you have to be in that receptive form and 
uh, art can aid or it can hinder you in that, right? Yeah, and and really, there's all kinds of spirits or deities that are willing to work with humans. They don't require sacrifices. They don't require you torture them into submission. They they don't require packs or transactions. So, uh, so we just recommend uh, we're coming at this from a pretty pagan perspective, but that's because we're trying to integrate traditional and theogen use. And it was the pagans who were more likely to be using mushrooms and uh, the the more benevolent and theogens. So as the pagans typically say, you know, if you're properly evoking the gods, then you don't really need to banish the demons or anything. Because, But at the same time, it can be what we call a banishing ritual can be useful just to help clear your mind of, of worldly uh, troubles or f focus more on to this magical plane and enter into your magical self, your magical identity, and into an altered state. Uh, so that like can to... be useful. Yeah. That's the... Sorry, go ahead. And if you want, you can do a smudging or light some incense that uh, can clear clean the area. But for the most part, uh, you know, if your intentions are right and your symbols are right, uh, then then you're going to be fine. So the way I like to consider this is I like to think about it. You're going to go and try and form a friendship. You're trying to meet someone and have a conversation, right? So. In order to do that, in order to engage that, the best things that you can do is like be presentable, make sure that you smell nice, you know, make sure that you're in a good mental state, you know, and then when you are approaching these spirits, have things that are connected to that spirit that you're trying to connect to, you know, use that image. And th those images of the spirits, they really, when I say that, we mean that in a very total kind of sense. So this can be everything from their sigils to their prayers to items from the natural world they're associated with, like plants, not not even necessarily entheogenic plants. It could be, you know, colored plants. It could be incenses. It could be foods. It could be anything, right? Yeah. So if you're going to be calling up a deity in particular, it helps to know something about the deity and <laughs> to study it to know the myths, and there might be traditional prayers like the Orphic hymns or something you can use, uh, bits and pieces from the PGM, that the Greek magical papyri that you can use, or whatever source material is available. But uh, that's where you can find their symbolism in descriptions of them, or as Snappy said, maybe plants or a crystal type. Now, if you can't find any very good ritual items to use for a particular deity, then the general purpose way to do that is to try to find an astrological category for the entity you want to call up. And then if you can do that, you know, some don't fit so well in that either, but if there's a good fit astrologically, then you can just use the symbola or natural magic items that are a best fit with that astrological variable or what usually the planets are what the gods are associated with so or you know it might be the elements or or whatever so that's a good general purpose way to find the correct symbolism and it's very practical, and there's many detailed books of correspondences and natural magic items you can use, as, for example, uh, The Magician's Table by Dr. Stephen Skinner. Yeah, that now, book is fantastic. Yeah, and it has all, all kinds of religions or cultures within it that are put within that astrological framework or Kabbalistic framework. So you can even have a common link to the Abrahamic religions if you want it. It's there. But 
you don't need to do it that way. So natural mat. So the key for entheogens then, and psychedelics in particular, is according to any basic uh, scientific view determined by what is called set and setting. So this refers to the mindset, which is your individual personality, your mood, your memories, what's going on in your life. So your general mindset is pretty straightforward. And then the setting is where you, where you are, who you're with, what you're doing, what what does it look like? Are you out in nature? Because the symbolism of your day-to-day -day life, if that's all around you, then that's going to in, in, impact the setting and so impact your trip. So this is why having designated sacred spaces is useful because you can take out all of the irrelevant or worldly symbolism so that you can better custom design your setting. Because and it's also, it's especially if you're connecting to a deity long term, having a space for them is like extraordinarily important. You know, something that's set aside a place for them that they understand, you know, that like oftentimes when I'm doing my magic, like we're talking about set and setting here, right? I have a set place that I do all of my rituals in. I have a seat that I sit in, you know, I have an altar that I work with. And this is extraordinarily important to me and to the deities I work with because I've invoked them into that space, you know, and I only use that space for this purpose, you know, like nothing else is ever done in that space because it is the space for spirits, you know, it's, it's their realm. When I enter into that space, it's like I'm crossing a threshold and I make sure that it's that it's an active understanding of that, you know, and it really helps to transport one into the proper mindset, you know, this is why it's so important that you, you know, you do things like you, before you enter, you, you make an offering because you're acknowledging the sanctity of the space, you know, and then when you go to begin, you say something because you're acknowledging what you're doing. This is all about, a lot of people take this for granted, but this is what transforms you and puts you in the proper headspace, right? Right. And it also allows for repetition which is important, you know, the more you use the same uh, props or space, the stronger it'll be, the more energy will be in there. And so the setting also helps to affect your mindset, especially when you're on theogens. So through ritual, you are hypnotizing yourself, but everything is in the mind of the oneness or through the chaos magic perspective everything is is in your mind anyway so you're learning to control your mind through ritual so that you can control your reality and entheogens can definitely help with this and you will see how your mind manifests very clearly on psychedelics in fact the word psychedelic means mind manifesting so it acts as a visual representation of your mind and will help to show you your own mind. So people who have bad trips are people who have a troubled mind to start with before they're going in. Right. And, and just to elaborate on this point, right? Like if you want to, like you, within the magic tradition, we're utilizing our thoughts as a tool. We're utilizing things like belief. So if you're trying to connect with a spirit or a deity, you want to make sure like that you are engaging in the right set of beliefs, in the right acknowledging that your head is in that place where you're prepared to connect with the spirit. You know, if you go into these rituals and your mind is wandering everywhere, the plants are going to show you what's bothering you, you know? Like <laughs> that's kind of what they're designed to do. Like you're saying, right they're, they're It's a revealing window to open up your mind. You know, I mean, some plants are easier to work with with others. Like if you work with something like marijuana, it's very easy to control. Whereas something like mushrooms where it's, it's a lot harder, you know, it's tends to just focus on what's ever on your mind right away. But even something like marijuana, it's very easy to become distracted 
you know, and to be caught within your own mind. And that's a good thing for meditation, but not necessarily for magic. Right. But uh, another, you know, crucial tip that is the hard truth that a lot of people won't want to hear is that it helps to meditate and practice concentration and visualization before you even attempt these entheogenic rituals. Now, you can use marijuana to to help learn this. It is useful. Well, not so much concentration, but uh, visualization, certainly. And the, the stronger your ability to concentrate, the the better you're going to be able to work these rituals. So that there's no shortcut to that. You have to build up your concentration through neuroplasticity and and this culture we live in is just not designed to do that. It's it's constantly trying to distract us with or make us multitasker. So it's very crucial to learn how to focus. And just to back up a little bit, because I know a lot of people, maybe they don't have it, they don't live in a place that they can dedicate a, a space to a temple. So, you know, do your best with what you got. But clean up the place if you're going to use your living room or whatever and and make sure the setting is right and try to uh, designate it as that. In that case, you know, a banishing is of at least the worldly energies is is particularly important. But you can always go outside too if you you know if you can find the right spot to do your rituals outside. That's that's wonderful. That's that's probably better than most temples anyway. So. Yeah, going into nature is always a good thing. It's just remember when you're going into nature to be aware that you're entering into a space where that's populated by other beings that other beings live in. And when you engage, you may, uh, you know, find yourself connecting to some of these energies as well, like trees or animals. You never know. Right. So you should plan that out beforehand when you're choosing the space that you go to. Uh you know, maybe that is your intention to connect with the local uh, spirits. You don't need to be calling on deities all the time. So um, another thing. And I would suggest that people do like you should connect with if there's a tree in your yard, you should know that tree, at least to a certain extent. If there's a river nearby, you should go talk to that river. You know, these are powerful, immediate spirits, right? Or better yet, if you can grow your own entheogens, then you can harvest from from them ritually and and then interact with them while you're in the altered state if if they're still you know if the plant is still alive. So that's actually something what it, you, it just made me think of something really interesting because this also relates to what you were talking about about cleaning and such. A really important and underrepresented aspect of the of the witch kind of practice is this act of you when you setting up your space and you're cleaning your space you're making it appropriate for deity right for spirit for that communion this is a sacred act this is a special act this is an act of service and it's the same thing when you're growing in theogens you know you do it as an act of service you're treating this plant with respect you're putting your love into it you're protecting it so that when you go to take the the uh, the drug from the plant the plant wants to give it to you and you're going to connect with that spirit in a much more profound way yeah so when we're talking about these ritual props especially when you're starting don't go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff okay if you can find it in nature that's that's great that's better or if you can make it yourself that's that's really good too cuz you can put your energy into it and save some money but uh, it's also... I would say things like you don't need to, instead of worrying about a robe or something, strip naked, go sky clad, you know, instead of worrying yeah. about something like a wand or an a theme, use your index finger, you know, like everything you have is here for you, right? Right. And so from a chaos magic perspective in particular, you want to keep it practical, keep it simple and experiment with each thing until you integrate it into your total system so that you know that what it does by itself and how effective it is or meaningful to you. So you don't buy all the tools all at once. You got to consecrate each one 
separately, and then it'll have power because you gave it power. And this goes for crystals or any magic or natural items you use as well. You want to have these consecrated before you go into the main trip. Before you use it for like mushrooms, you might want to yeah consecrate it with marijuana previously. So, uh, or or even just in a norm in a sober state of mind. So, yeah, uh, for sure, and just. Going that back way. to that set and setting before we, we move completely on, it's like being in that right mindset is so important too, right? We want to make sure that um, that when you are connecting to any of these spirits that you you know what you want and you know what you want to say, you know, and like and you know you know what you're after and that you're like like Rich was talking about concentration is beyond important in that. Yeah, and so you should also have your intentions well worked out beforehand uh, and even the phrasing of it. And if you're going to ask questions of a deity, then try to think of the questions beforehand. Don't just ramble on to to the deity. Try to have a schedule if you can. I mean, depending on how complex what you're doing is. So just so you can remind yourself because you might, you might forget. <laughs> so or get distracted. So if you have a lot of things to do. So these are all aspects of set and setting and uh, different colors might have astrological symbolism, different music notes also have astrological symbolism. Same with different incenses for smells. And then you can also have this is a perfect job. example I can give people. So one of the deities I regularly connect with is Saturn, right? That's the planet Saturn. Saturn. So I do this every Saturday where I am lighting a black candle because that's related to Saturn. I have a black box and inside the black box, I've put various ritual items to represent the deity. I have a piece of obsidian glass. I have an iron nail. I have some cannabis and I have some storax and a few other, you know, image, image based things. And I use that cube then as like the idol on the idol that I focus on, you know, and then also I will light uh, Storax incense before this, and I'll meditate. So usually I'll, every Saturday, I'll light a candle, I'll light some incense in front of that box. And then I'll go into a med meditative state where I'm having a communion, you know? Right. So um, to continue on, set and setting is obviously well connected to our five senses. So we got the smell with the incense. We got the colors for vision. We got uh, different body positions or ritual postures. We can use asanas. At, they're called in uh, in yoga. So that would be for touch then we can have different flavors we can add to our entheogenic potions, which can help. Uh, like you can, this can be as simple as different flavors of tea, or you can get like mint extract or something to add to your mushroom tea or whatever it is to kind of put that, that uh, symbolize that intention. So the flavors will match according to the astrological correspondences and you can experiment with this on your own to find what's best with you uh, or just all kinds of herbs that might be added to that. So what else have we got? What am I forgetting here? Touch, taste, smell, hearing is the tones. And so all of these can combine to create the uh, magical setting. And this will influence your mindset, but they all and they all have very specific symbolic meaning. Now, in ancient paganism, uh, the clearest example of entities associated with set and setting that I can think of are for setting is certainly the Greek charities or graces they're called, and they accompany Aphrodite, and they were deities of setting up for the festivals and the holidays. This 
deities of decoration and and just setting up all of the the temples or whatever wherever the rituals were being placed whereas the muses can be used to enter into specific mind states though all kinds of deities have specific mind states that they can help you enter into especially those with astrological uh, that fit into astrological categories are easy to identify what kind of mind states that they will help you with so it can be useful to uh, to call on them if you want to enter into that while you're setting your intention so we have the basics of how to approach a ritual and what what you're going to be doing to control it other things you can do is generate energies in a particular color color you're going to want to have magic words as well uh, like a mantra that you can use specific mantras for a deity that can just be the name of the deity but knowing their epithets and titles can help you have much more specific forms of them according to your intention and and just help to make a more detailed mantra and there's all kinds of ways you can design a mantra uh, certainly uh, Tantric texts and, and Hindu texts have detailed ideas about letter symbolism and how to design mantras, which is very close to Kabbalah. But you can do this with any alphabet, or you could even make your own alphabet of desire, it's called, in Chaos Magic. But that's another topic on yeah, itself. You see that, that that's something like Austin Osman Spar was doing, but like, the idea, like Rich is saying here, is to try and make sure that you are connecting to this force through this, like when you're engaging with something like a mantra, right? It's it's the, the creation of sound and vibration throughout the body, you know? So the mantras are usually designed to not just invoke the deity, but to also put you into that uh, relaxed state, into that focused state, and to activate, like, certain mantras are designed to activate certain chakras within the body, you know, to have a certain experience. Now, if you're creating a mantra on your own, it may not do that, but it's still the point is you like, you want to be invoked. Almost all mantras invoke a sacred name, right? They're going to be connecting to that deity or that spirit directly through the name. Then usually they have a descriptor. They'll talk about the power of the deity, what the deity is doing, you know? So, or like Rich was saying, they'll give epithets, right? So you can do this yourself if you wanted to create a poem. The idea is you want to create something that's rhythmic, that you can chant, that is not going to be too long, and that's going to be something that you can easily breathe and say, like, within a single breath. Like, for me, ideal mantras are mantras that are mantras that I can get into, and really put, breathe out all of the air into and vibrate my whole body into. And so, you know, I say the mantra and then I'll expel all of the air. And this will help me to get into a very rhythmic sense of breathing. It, it, it sets a pace for, for my mind. It connects me to the deity. It connects me to space. It's, it's an all around very powerful thing. Right. So it'll just, if you start to get uh, distracted, or, uh, you know, overwhelmed in some way, it can help to bring you back into focus and just to reestablish that connection with the spirit or deity. And you don't, you're not necessarily going to be doing it constantly throughout the whole ritual, but it's good to know beforehand and certainly while you're coming up to have these mantras and, uh, and key phrases that you can use to symbolize your intention and reuse in various rituals uh, according to your needs. So another, uh, so you can use this in conjunction with images. You can get a statue 
if you're really dedicated to a particular deity. But I, I recommend you hold off on that because they're usually expensive. And really, um, in my experience, and as with, you know, most of these symbols in general, if they can be sometimes expensive, right? So what you can do instead is just print out a picture of the deity. You don't need a statue. A, a printed picture works really, really well, especially while you're tripping out. The picture can come alive and start moving around and talking to you, and it it might even work better than a statue. I haven't really experimented too much with statues, but just the complex imagery on an image on a picture can be more detailed and colorful than a statue, and that you can integrate there are all kinds of traditional symbolism into that picture. You might even make a kind of collage of different symbols associated with that deity because there's not too many artists who make pictures of the gods with this often they're not super traditional anyway so hopefully that will change with ai generated images or something so these are called theurgic images in the greek tradition and they have a whole complex philosophy about why certain symbols are used uh, and how they work on the mind and how they help to achieve union with the deity. My, it's Theurgy is not exactly the same as yoga, but it's the closest Western equivalent to it, uh, particularly bhakti yoga, which just means devotion and is a similar kind of worship it's not exactly worship because you're trying to unify with the deity, but it's what if you didn't know about philosophy and you saw them doing it, you might think they're worshiping this these idols or these images and, and making offerings of incense or rice or whatever herb. But it's they're trying to unify with the deity or learn from the deity in some way. Yeah, they're trying to be almost kind of like a, a possession type experience or a bow, right? Often these bhakti yogas, these yogis, right? They're trying to really connect with that spirit in a way that the spirit becomes personal. Right. And you can see this in some tantric texts like the Tara Tantra is a Buddhist example of this. And it seem, and they use cannabis incense in front of this tapestry of the goddess and make offerings to her and you're doing the chants and mantras so most of the rituals that you're going to find in old texts actually have a lot of the same practical methods it's just different symbolism that they're using uh, according to their own traditions so right and it's all based around the same ideas we've been talking about here right basically this idea of set and setting and creating like it's, you want to have a place in which you are invoking the deity that's set aside, that's clean, and that's sacred. You want to make sure that you are engaging them in a direct way, that you're in the right mindset, you know? And then they utilize all, all of the things that they're doing with this with the symbols and the incense are all about connecting to that specific spirit and, to, and trying to ask for specific things. That's where the real differences manifest, but they're all operating on the same kind of physics. Yeah, and so I, another, you know, you can have all the jewels and gold in your ritual if you want, if you just put it on the printed picture. <laughs> it's a lot easier that way. And uh, so it's... It's a lot simpler than it might seem at first just because people get lost in the specific symbolic details and stuff. And that's important to know that so that the symbols are meaningful to you, but it's not that the... But it's only useful if it's meaningful to you. If you have the crystals out and, the, and you don't know what they mean and, and you don't believe that it works, then it's not going to work. So this is this is a key that a lot of modern people have trouble with. Like you have to you have to play with belief. You really have to man you want you want to connect with these things then you have to believe it. It's it's just that 
fundamental, you know, and the more you put your belief in, the more you make your acts a sacred action, the more you you do everything with a purpose and with a will, the more likely you are to succeed in, in this path. Now, if a natural item physically looks like something that reminds you of your deity or your intention, then then it is going to be meaningful to you if you allow it to be anyway. So so this so it's not totally arbitrary in how you choose your stuff. Though from a chaos magic perspective, you can consecrate just about anything if you want and you can make up your own deities if that's what's meaningful to you. So if you're artistically inclined, draw an image of your own god or or whatever you want to do, but this it's it's still useful to learn from traditional stuff and and we can give you more specific examples rather than trying to we're not going to be presenting you with our own original creations here so we'll just use traditional stuff as an example but just keep in mind that you can always customize it for your needs or start from scratch so um again right the point is always what works you know, so if you're connecting with something and you're having a conversation, then that's important and that works. And whatever that is to you is what it is. Yeah, you can make a deity of your unconscious if you want to communicate with your unconscious. You can do that even as an atheist if you want. So, uh, or you can make your own familiar spirits in Chaos Magic. They're called servitors. But uh, we'll get into the more specific details of that in another video. For now, though, we're just going to talk about things that relate specifically to entheogens. So, okay, so we have all of these uh, different props that we can potentially use, but again, you can keep it simple and, and slowly add to complexify your rituals as you experiment with them and find what works for you. Yeah. And like, I, I would start small, you know, like we're talking about doing this entheogen kind of work, connect to the spirit of cannabis, start with cannabis and, you know, try to connect to a, just that plant, ingest it. You know, I would suggest if you're comfortable smoking to actually consume it as an edible because you're more likely to have a psychedelic experience. And while you're in that kind of state, try to stay in a meditative split, in a meditative place you know where your mind is focused upon connecting to deity or to connecting to spirit of the plant you know and while you're doing that you know listen and learn to just kind of appreciate and see what unfolds right so depending on what traditions and symbolism you are interested you can make a ritual made up of four basic stages Stage one is preparing everything, such as doing the banishing or consecrating the space, and then using the entheogens or various things or people involved, then setting up any props you might be using. Stage two is calling up various energies or tuning the ritual area and the mind according to your intention. Stage three is directing those energies in some way to fulfill the will or otherwise executing your will in a particular operation. And by operation, I mean occult procedure, such as divination, scrying, evocation, invocation. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more what those are in a bit. Stage four is the closing ceremony or giving thanks and saying goodbye to the spirits and energies involved. Depending on the energies you invoke, often people like to banish again, but maybe you especially if you have a temple then you, you just say goodbye and that's good enough like if you want this if you want the entities to stick around you don't you don't banish them these are guidelines but for a general rule of thumb you should banish consecrate the theogens during the preparatory part so you you also want to pray over the entheogens before you even take them you can do this beforehand in a different ritual say it like a full moon or a particularly relevant astrological time uh, the seven days of the week correspond to the seven planets so you can 
you don't need to be a slave to astrology, but if you, if you can go with the, you know, if it's convenient to go with the timing, I like to do it. That's how I do it. So you can then state your intentions, praying to the spirit of the entheogen with your hands, and then you dose it. You can also then draw out your sigil, like physically make a sigil according to your intention. If you want to use it to, if you like, it's often useful when uh, working a sigil for any intention to be in a state of entheogenic gnosis. It's called chemonosis in chaos magic. And uh, cannabis can be fine for that. Smoking the weaker end of salvia can be good for that. Like salvia leaf can induce or ego death pretty easily so small amounts of mushrooms are good too like a lot of people you know they want to be doing heroic doses but you can do a lot of really um you can have a lot of profound meditative experiences if you're doing smaller amounts you know like two to three grams rather than you know five six seven or more right so the way a lot of people evoke energies is tracing out Geometric shapes like, say, a five-pointed star is a, uh, and then each arm of the five-pointed star corresponds to an element. And so depending on which arm you start at going clockwise, you trace out the star and that would help to evoke that element. And there are ways to, ev you can evoke planets the goal in a similar way. Uh, in the Golden Dawn, they use a hexagram, like a Star of David, to do that. Others might use a seven-pointed star or... You know, Thelemites or, use the unicrucial hexagram. There's there's a variety of different kind of whatever, things. According to your tradition, you can just trace out the symbol with your finger, if you want, like the astrological symbol of a planet. That work will work fine as well in the four corners, and then you intone it. You visualize this in the appropriate color and in tone with the mantra. And this is just a, help, a way to consecrate an area or or to consecrate a ritual prop or your entheogens or a person. And you can call this energy into yourself, visualizing the colored energy within yourself, using the mantra as well. So, you know, the Golden Dawn is very useful to study but it's got abrahamic symbolism in it and you know it's maybe more complex than some people want it to be so yeah I, I there's a lot of good there you know like i always recommend people to read the israeli regardi text there uh the gd the big one there's a lot of interesting stuff but you know remember right where it's coming from it's a you know upper class european largely masculine, largely Christianized order, you know? So I like a lot of Crowley stuff because he kind of flips it on its head and he brings some paganism in, but you also have to be weary of Crowley too, you know, because Crowley does a lot of egotistical stuff and he also, um, you know, he's a little bit wishy-washy on in some areas as well, especially in regards to women, <laughs> so. Right, well... Yeah, if we're going to get into the personal flaws of yeah. of, of occultists, we're going to be here a long time. But <laughs> So don't worry too much about that. Just make it your own. But at the very least, uh, the Golden Dawn was so influential on modern neo-paganism and Wicca and all kinds of other traditions that it's good to know it just for context. And, uh, and it gives you a little bit of everything, right? It gives you a bit of Solomonic magic, Kabbalah, um, it gives you some Hindu practice, like some yogic practices. It's engaged in some theurgic stuff. Like they, they borrow from everywhere. You know, there's Hermeticism, Gnosticism, Christian Kabbalah. It's, it's all over the place. <laughs> so just to continue with the kind of outline of a ritual, uh, we've got those four stages, okay? So make sure you bring everything you will need into the circle with you beforehand. You try to have it all planned out. Once you have banished, try your best not to break the circle unless you really have to. Just because it'll ruin, fuck with your intention, right? So, 
Then begin stage two and call up the elements or planetary energies while you're coming up. A lot of people kind of only, they forget about how important, like once you've, once you've taken the dose, it can take like an hour, an hour and a half for you to come up on mushrooms. Though if you grind them up and have it in some tea or, or hot chocolate, Living it can hit, or... hit, you, hit you a lot faster. But you're still, while you're coming up, you need to still be in a ritual space. You don't want to just start your ritual while you're peaking. So this is what I call like the tuning phase. Of, and uh, this is all what your mindset is during your coming up phase is going to affect your whole trip. So you want to make sure you're, you're doing something spiritual. Yeah, and... normally I what I will do, and I know like it's not conducive to, to everyone, but I will, as soon as I ingest my mushrooms, I go into my sacred space, like in my circle, and then I'm meditating until I'm starting to feel the onsets of that of those feelings and because i've worked with this particular entheogen a lot i can i understand when the come up is about to to happen you know but you want to yeah ingest the entheogen ritually and then come up doing while you're doing rituals so it can take a while but it'll be worth it and uh you can if nothing else just practice your visualizations and mantras so Starting I stage find two. it's harder sometimes to use the, the 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 faster come up drugs, you know, because sometimes right. I'm not in the right headspace, you know. Yeah, you have less time to get your mindset right. So, anyway, st start with stage two. Call up the elements or planetary energies. This will be different according to what entheogen it is or how long the ritual will be, as different entheogens take longer than others to come into effect, as it can take. 60, yeah. So, depending on how you call up the energies, you may be comfortable doing the tuning phase in the entheogenic state, or if it's a fast-acting one like DMT, snuff, or s smoking DMT or salvia, you may wish to wait until you're almost at stage 3 to dose. Doing some of the more complex rituals is perhaps not that practical with certain entheogens, but may be doable with others. So in the case of smoking DMT or salvia, they only last five minutes or so, the main trip anyway. Key parts of the ritual in stage three will have the best times in, that would be most appropriate for these, but not for the longer ones like mushrooms that can last eight hours.